All right. So welcome everyone uh, for joining us on your lunch break or just the middle of the Friday. Really excited to have you all here. I hope everyone has been weathering this pandemic um, as best as we can. I know it's been challenging times. People have been impacted in different ways, uh, but really excited that you all have decided to join us today for a conversation uh, that is very important to us at the Vera Institute of Justice. Um, just to kind of give you a big overview, um, this webinar has given me a reason to cut my hair and to throw on some actual clothes. Uh, the great thing about Zoom is that you can't see the back of my head because I did have a, a couple of uh, misalignments, but um, that's to be expected. We'll certainly be excited when uh, I can go back to my barber. I want to remind folks to be present on speaker view. Hopefully you can see my screen. Uh, it's coming up now. Let's see. Okay. All right, so have the screen for you all to see. One second. As I'm getting this adjusted, I'm trying to figure out how to see my notes at the same time, but if we can't. Okay, I think we got that. Um, we are going to be doing an overview of how the criminal legal system has been impacted by this pandemic. And before I dive into that, I want to just kind of give you a brief description about the Vera Institute of Justice, um, giving a little bit of highlight of the work that we've been doing in New Orleans before coronavirus, uh, addressing the ways in which we're seeing coronavirus impacting the criminal legal system, and how the system has really been adapting and where we think we need to go next. Uh, at the end of this conversation, I'll probably present for maybe about 30 to 35 minutes, be writing questions and submitting them. We'll, we'll have a Q&A at the end. Hopefully it will be somewhat of a, a virtual dialogue uh, with the questions that you might have. So for those that um, may not be familiar with the Vera Institute of Justice, really excited to introduce you to the Vera Institute. Um, we are a nonprofit focusing on reforming the criminal legal system. And we blend policy expertise with data analysis and technical assistance to reshape, to reimagine, and to redefine what our criminal legal system should look like. Uh, we envision a society, one of the values that we have is really envisioning the society that respects the dignity of every person and safeguards justice for everyone. I came to work at Vera in 2018, and I really was excited to join Vera because it's a nonprofit that has justice in its name, and that actually means something. It's not there because it's a buzzword. It's there because we believe in what our criminal legal system should actually look like, and we have a plan to make those changes happen. Uh, Vera was founded in 1961 with a particular focus uh, on bail reform, something called the Manhattan Bail Project. We have since evolved into an organization that addresses almost every single issue within our criminal legal system. Uh, we do work in 40 states, and we've been in New Orleans since 2006. Um, I have the privilege of being the director of the New Orleans office, and the folks that you see on the screen is, is my wonderful team. Uh, I'm the director of the New Orleans office. Uh, Sarah Omojula is our associate director. Teresa McKinney is our research associate. It's also her birthday today, so I hope we all can wish her a happy birthday. Uh, Michaela Bono is our program associate focusing on uh, bail fines and fees work. Allison, she does some work with the New Orleans team. Um, she's also on a national team as a senior bail planner. Dana Andrews, our community manager. Uh, Josh Pichon is our program associate doing a lot of work uh, with the Safety and Justice Challenge and assisting the city of New Orleans in reducing jail population. 
and Marilyn Sinkowitz is a senior research associate. We first came to New Orleans in 2006, right after Hurricane Katrina, with a specific focus on trying to reduce the jail population. Uh, after Hurricane Katrina, the city was in a moment of trying to rebuild itself, and we were invited by a council member to come and help suggest reforms that could be implemented to reduce the jail population. Uh, before Hurricane Katrina, the average monthly jail population was about 6,500 people. Now we're averaging around 1,100. So it's been a huge reduction, a huge testament that this size of the city does not need that size of a jail. And even though we've had that reduction, we've missed the mark on reducing our racial and ethnic disparities. But that is some of the work that we're doing today. Um, before coronavirus, you know, hit our country, hit our state, hit our city, uh, we were doing work in a variety of areas. Uh, one area of work that I mentioned really what brought us to New Orleans uh, was reducing the jail population as well as the jail footprint. When we talk about the jail footprint, um, before Hurricane Katrina, the New Orleans jail was really uh, distributed amongst seven different buildings uh, near an intersection called Tulane and Broad which is really the main intersection of, of the criminal legal system. At that intersection, you have the courts, you have the public defenders, a block or so over, you have uh, the DA's office and the jail is, is, is behind that building as well. Police headquarters, bail bondsmen. Really, when you're talking about the criminal legal system in New Orleans, we often say uh, Tulane and Broad. And we talk about shrinking the footprint. Uh, before Katrina, as I mentioned, we had those seven different buildings and now we have one main jail. Um, there's currently discussions about potentially building another, uh, constructing another building specifically to house people with serious mental illness. Uh, we don't think that's necessary. There's space in the current jail that could be retrofit to house um, those particular individuals. Another area of work is called ending money injustice. And when we use that term money injustice, uh, we're referring to the way that money is baked into the system and the way that is actually extracting wealth from poor and poor black and brown folks in New Orleans both on the front end in terms of money bail, as well as fines and fees on the tail end. Another area of work that Vera does nationally, we have a national team called Reshaping Prosecution. Uh, this team is led by Johnny Hodge and they often get deployed to jurisdictions to give technical assistance to uh, prosecutors that have run on a reform platform and helps them make those policies a reality. Uh, in New Orleans, we're, we're kind of doing a, a pre uh, lead up to an election where we're not necessarily getting behind a particular candidate, but we are getting behind policies and our reshaping prosecution work in New Orleans is specifically educating people in this city on A, what the district attorney does, but also B, understanding what types of policies we should be expecting from a 21st century prosecutor. We've also been asked by the state legislature to do a jury study specifically looking at the impact a law would have if we restored jury rights to people with felony convictions. Um, currently in the state of Louisiana, people with felony convictions can vote, but they cannot be on a jury. So we'll be doing a study looking at the impact that would have if the law in fact changed. And another area of work that we were working on before um, coronavirus is a community supporter release program. A lot of our work is focused on reducing the jail population in a safe and efficient way. And we wanna make sure that when people are no longer being held pre-trial, that they are getting the necessary support they need to attend court, to follow along with their case. If they need childcare assistance, if they need transportation or text reminders, uh, the Community Supporter Release Program will be uh, aiming to address those concerns. I want to start off with just sharing three separate stories. And, and the first I want to tell you about is, is Maria. And as Maria gets ready for bed, she's worried about this tingling in the back of her throat. It's not quite fully scratchy, it's not quite sore, but it has the potential of representing something, some type of sickness, and she's scared. James is um, returns from home, um, returns from work every night, and before he gets out of his car as he pulls into the driveway, he often prays for protection. And he prays for protection because when he gets out of his car and before he goes into his home, he knows on the other side of that door is his three-year-old son. 
And throughout the day, he has been in a work environment where he has been exposed to people uh, with coronavirus. And he prays that he does not bring that into his home to impact his family. And the third story I want to tell you about is Devin. Devin's a young kid who hasn't had regular school in a while. And when he wakes up in the morning, he thinks about when will things be returning back to normal? Well, Maria represents people in Louisiana that are in our detention centers. And we have at least seven ICE detention facilities in Louisiana. And among those facilities there are 51 people with positive coronavirus cases. Um, our friend at ALAS, Lisa Marie Rose, reminds us that immigrant detention is an arm of mass incarceration. And Louisiana has been successful in reducing its prison population over the last few years. But unfortunately, the space that has been made available by those reforms are now being filled with people facing deportation proceedings. James is a deputy in our local jail. And the reason why he often prays for protection is because 58 of his colleagues have tested positive for coronavirus. And unfortunately, one of his colleagues has died from it. In that very same jail where James has to show up to work every day, there are 103 incarcerated people that have tested positive. If this were an office, what would our reaction be knowing that there were 103 people um, that were positive in, in an office or 58 of the colleagues were positive in an office? Or we think about Maria's case, right? If, if that were a church and we knew that there were 51 people positive with coronavirus, what would our reactions be? And for Devin, Devin represents kids that are in our detention centers around Louisiana. And amongst four different youth detention centers in Louisiana, 28 kids have tested positive for coronavirus and 27 employees have tested positive for coronavirus. If that were a school, what would our reaction be? I also wanna share with you that the number of incarcerated kids in Louisiana that have tested positive for coronavirus represent almost half of the kids in this country that are detained in youth detention centers that have tested positive with coronavirus. You may have heard on the news for people that aren't based in New Orleans, but we have a very high rate of coronavirus positive cases in the city and isn't just limited to those of us in the free world. It is impacting those folks that are in jail, that are in prison, and that are in immigrant detention centers as well. We think about the messages that we have received in the free world of washing our hands to be able to protect ourselves or, or to use hand sanitizer or to wear a mask to avoid crowds. It's important to know that there's no such thing as social distancing in jails. There's no social distancing in prisons and there's no social distancing in detention centers. The only solution to mitigating the harm coronavirus poses to the people in these jails and prisons and detention centers is to simply let people out. Now, these are people, and sometimes it's hard to remember that, the way that our criminal legal system often creates these schemas in our mind to view people behind bars as scary, violent, dangerous people, but they are people first. And we have to understand that these people have been put in these jails, prisons, and detention centers not to die, but for people with capital cases, people are in these facilities with the expectation of being able to come home. But we have to be able to understand ways in which we need to be adjusting in times of coronavirus to ensure the health of all people, not just in the free world, but those that are behind bars as well. We can't talk about the coronavirus in the United States or in Louisiana without specifically referencing the racial disparities across systems. The image that you see on the left is from the Power Coalition for Equity and Justice. And it represents that 32% of the people in Louisiana are Black. And then it tells us that in early April, 70% of the deaths as a result of COVID-19 were from Black folks as well. And when I heard that figure 70%, obviously I was alarmed and I was shocked. And it actually sounded a little familiar because the image on the right represents the data we have from the Louisiana State Department of Corrections. And you'll be able to see that 66.5, roughly 67% of the prison population are Black folks. And so here we have these two separate areas, these two separate systems, 
where the disparities are, 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 are quite the same. And for New Orleans, 90% of the jail population is made up of black males. Now, it's easy to think that there's something unique about black folks that contributed to these disparities. But we have to talk about the policies that actually have fueled these disparities as well. Additionally, it's hard to correlate cause and effect when there's more distance between two different things. If there's a gap, the mind wants to make excuses for why those things happen. There was a really interesting article that I, I, some of you may have been able to see. Uh, Professor Ibram Kendi poses this question of, or, or answering the question like who's to blame with regards to the high numbers of coronavirus deaths and African Americans in our country. He represents that we need to stop blaming black people for dying of the coronavirus. And the reason why I wanted to share this particular article because he reminds us that data can be weaponized, right? We can take this number like we have in Louisiana where 70% of the deaths of coronavirus result from, are, are um, of African American people that we can't simply say that, have that conversation and just talk about black folks having a higher rate of coronavirus deaths and saying that they're attributable to diabetes asthma or high blood pressure. We have to remember and understand both in the health context and our health systems and those disparities, as well as the disparities we see in our criminal legal system, that there's nothing wrong with black folks that some policy did not create. Right, we're talking about policies that have promoted food deserts or healthcare disparities or redlining or gentrification or environmental and institutional racism that lead to these underlying conditions that are fueling these disparities in these two systems. You know, sometimes in this work and in these fields, we get so interested in solving the problem that's right in front of us, instead of solving the problem that created the problem that's right in front of us. And as we think about our work at the Vera Institute of Justice, we are interested in understanding how social determinants of health are leading to these disparities in our criminal legal system, how biases, implicit biases of actors and of leaders of criminal legal uh, system leaders and system actors in the criminal legal system, how their own implicit biases are impacting these disparities as well, because we know it's not just the cause, but we know it's not just um, one thing that is leading to these disparities. So we know how coronavirus is posing this threat to us in the community, us in the free world, and it's also posing a threat to people in jails, prisons, and detention centers. And I just want to share some information about what's different locally and what's not different locally. So on the left side of your screen, you should be able to see that in New Orleans, we had a population of 1,052 people before, at the very end of February. Um, and now we are roughly around 804. And this reduction is almost 25% reduction didn't just happen overnight. It certainly was a collaborative process. Uh, my friends at the Public Defender's Office have been very, uh, dogged and zealous about trying to get people they represent out of that jail because they know the threat that coronavirus poses to them. Judges have been having conversations with defense attorneys and public defenders about what cases to consider to reduce bail and so that those people can in fact be released from the jail. Um, as with many things in New Orleans, you know, criminal justice reform is a collaborative process. And so there's been organizations like OPPRC, Justice Accountability Center, Vote, um, Daughters Beyond Incarceration, the public defenders that have been raising this alarm about how we should be concerned about the people that are in jail, um, particularly with the way that coronavirus is going to impact them because jails are cesspools, are petri dishes, are spaces where the coronavirus would very easily spread. So we've seen a reduction in our jail population. So that's different, but I would argue to you that we're not low enough. If you look at that bottom figure, you'll be able to see that the jail population at an international incarceration rate for New Orleans should be 137, and we're at 1,052. Louisiana is, has been known for quite some time as the prison capital of the world. And New Orleans is one of those leading parishes in Louisiana with the highest incarceration rate. Uh, we're still about 1.3 times above national averages. And although we have had a tremendous reduction over the last 12 years of our local jail population, we still have more room to go. 
So we've seen this reduction in jail population. We've also actually seen somewhat of a reduction in arrests. Felony arrests have dropped, misdemeanor arrests have dropped, but I would also argue to you that we haven't done enough. There are still cases coming through first appearances uh, for people that are charged with simple possession of marijuana, uh, for people that are charged with having a, a single pill of oxycodone without a prescription, or for failure to return uh, a, a, rent, a rental vehicle. And these are not cases that need to be coming through the system right now. Because when there are these interactions between the police officers and the people they encounter, we don't know who may be sick. We don't know who might have coronavirus. So we're potentially putting two people at risk because even in that police encounter, there's no way that either person could be appropriately protecting themselves. In a custodial arrest, the officer has to pat the person down, has to put that person um, you know, in the squad car and then transport them to jail, transporting them to a place where we know coronavirus already exists. And so we should be thinking about it, where does humanity, the idea of humanity lie in understanding who should be taken to jail at this particular time, but also how do we challenge the assumptions that prove that we don't need to keep all these people in jail to promote public safety because we've seen this reduction in the jail population and we've also seen a reduction in crime. The jail is now doing some testing uh, of the people that are being held pre-trial and as you see, the number is growing. Uh, I think right now we're around, maybe around 350 positive cases. I, I, I can't remember the, the number, exact number right now. Um, but this number is going to continue to rise, right? With more testing, you're going to get more positive results. And it will just become more and more obvious that by keeping people in this jail unnecessarily, more and more people are going to be, get, be getting sick. And it's not just the people that are being held pretrial, it's the people that are working there, that are coming in and out of that facility to show up for work, like that example, the story of Jane, who are then coming home, who are then potentially getting other people sick in the community, when really what we need to be doing is, con is, is not spreading um, coronavirus in that particular fashion. I want you all to look at this headline. Just take a second, just read the headline. Now look at the date. So I can't hear you all, I can't see your faces, but I can imagine some of you having a very perplexed look on your face. Some of you asking, is this an actual headline where we've been talking about ways in which we need to be social distancing each other from each other. And I was just very, very disheartened and discouraged that the New Orleans Police Department announced this policy to conduct seatbelt usage checkpoints? Seatbelts? Are we really talking about seatbelts right now? In a time of pandemic where New Orleans has very, very high cases, it's a very high positive rate, and you're gonna have the audacity to have checkpoints right now? Nothing could be more pretextual. And just when we thought we might be able to make some progress with figuring out what types of arrests should be made during this time, just very, very disappointed with the decision to put up these checkpoints to see if people are wearing their seatbelt. And it's not just that. They're also checking to see if their brake tags have been expired, that their insurance is up to date. And it's important to know that these are all traffic related things. But why are you checking things related to traffic when the Department of Motor Vehicles is closed? So how is it that somebody might have something that is expired, but doesn't actually have the, the Office of Motor Vehicles, Department of Motor Vehicles to go and remedy that issue. And they're doing this under the guise of wanting to provide information about the stay-at-home order that's currently in place. Who do you think doesn't know about the stay-at-home stay order right now? We are, I don't know, four or five, six weeks into this thing. And to try to disguise this tactic of pretextual stops of people in this city for seatbelts and brake tags, it, 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 in my opinion, it, it's, it's offensive, it is not called for. And on top of that, when I have had friends that have been stopped at these checkpoints, they've relayed that the police officers are not wearing masks. They don't have the appropriate PPEs. And so it's just really irresponsible at this point in time um, to be trying to use these types of checkpoints 
uh, as pretextual stops and it's really discouraging. And I hope that um, our, our partners at the New Orleans Police Department can see how they are not only putting their police officers at risk, but they're also putting the people they encounter at risk of transmitting and contracting coronavirus. And this is simply not something we need our officers dedicating their time and resources to. Not having a brake tag or not wearing your seatbelt or not having insurance at this moment in time during this pandemic is not harming people in the way of what we need to be concerned about. If there is violent crime occurring in the city of New Orleans, our police officers should be positioned to respond to those incidents and not being worried about whether or not somebody's wearing a seatbelt. So what is different statewide? I wish there were more. Um, at least two incarcerated people have died of coronavirus. And I believe, uh, I'm sorry, there actually there was an announcement today, three incarcerated people have passed away in the custody of the Department of Corrections and two staff members have passed away. Um, the Louisiana Department of Corrections has established this review panel um, where they're trying to focus on nonviolent uh, offenders that are near completion of their sentence. And they announced that the goal of this review panel uh, was to you know, reduce the number of people in prison. Well, the policies and the criteria that they have put out um, really isn't doing much. So our current prison population is around 32,000 state prisoners, 32,000 incarcerated people in our state prisons. With the criteria that has been laid forward, 1,100 people are eligible for release under the furlough program. Only 1,100 out of that 3,200. And then in Louisiana, half of our prison population are actually held in local jails uh, in different parishes around the state of Louisiana. Uh, we say parish, it's the same thing as a county. So local parish jails are holding state uh, prisoners. And with the criteria that the review panel has put forward, only 100 incarcerated people that are housed in these state uh, facilities are going to be eligible. Something else that is concerning for us is the usage of Camp J at Angola. So Camp J is a facility at Angola. Angola is the Louisiana State Penitentiary. It's, our, it's, it's a prison, it's a prison plantation. It's called Angola, which might, for some of you, sound weird. What, why would a prison be called Angola? Is that named after a particular person, named after a governor? No, it's actually named after the country in Africa where the enslaved people were brought from to work on this plantation. And this land in Louisiana uh, was a plantation and has been converted into a prison plantation. And on this prison plantation, they have Camp J, where they are going to be using Camp J to house people that have tested positive for COVID-19. And these are people that are coming from around the state. Now, it's important to know that Camp J was closed in 2018 because of its deplorable conditions. And actually the Vera Institute of Justice through its Safe Alternative to Segregation Initiative was involved in closing Camp J. And Camp J was described as a microcosm of a lot of things that are wrong. Right now there are about 24 people that are pretrial detainees that are at Camp J. So these are folks that have not been sentenced or convicted or, or found guilty, but they're at Angola at Camp J and about seven incarcerated people from Angola are also at Camp J. So roughly about 32 people are currently in Camp J. It is uh, an older facility that is not fit to house um, anybody, let alone people that are sick with coronavirus. I wanna highlight something that uh, is, is really concerning to a lot of us in Louisiana. Um, uh, our friends Fox and Rob have been big champions of recognizing uh, this woman who, who, who goes by Mama Glow. And she is, her, her full name is Gloria Williams. And she was granted, uh, or she received a unanimous recommendation um, for clemency from the parole board, I believe uh, last July. And unfortunately, that commutation has not yet been signed by the governor. Um, she is the longest serving incarcerated woman in Louisiana. And the papers, as I understand it, are on the governor's desk. But as she's been waiting since last July, since the um, parole board's unanimous recommendation that she be freed, she's contracted coronavirus in this last few months and is now in critical condition. 
And so when we're thinking about what is the humane thing to do and, and what is different statewide or what could be different, you know, there are names and there are, there are applications for commutations and paroles and furloughs that are on the governor's desk that are with the leadership of the Department of Corrections to really understand why we need to be getting more people um, out of our detention facilities, out of our prisons, and granting the release of those vulnerable uh, people in those populations. So what can we do, right? Um, social distancing in the criminal legal system means decarceration. And sometimes our gut reaction to this idea of letting people out of jail or letting people out of prison or letting people out of uh, immigrant detention centers, sometimes our gut reaction is, why would you do that? You know, you're letting all these violent, scary criminals out into our streets and our crime is gonna go up and there's gonna be blood in the streets. And there really isn't any proof that that is what would happen. And in fact, we have seen a, a, a reduction across the country in the number of people that are, in our, that are incarcerated. And we have not seen a correlation in the increase of crime. Um, our, our friend Bruce Riley at, at, uh, at Vote um, reminded us, had this example. He said, if a plane were to crash and the ambulance and the EMTs and the first responders are running to administer aid to the survivors, would we expect them to do background checks first before administering the necessary medical help? And when we're talking about people's in jail and prisons and detention centers, we have to remember them as people first. Even though so many things that we have been exposed to in our, in our society, to, to treat these people as if they are not people at all, we have to remember that they are somebody's mother, somebody's father, somebody's brother, somebody's sister. And what Brian Stevenson always, often reminds us of is like, People are so much more than the worst thing that they have ever done. And so as we think about how we need to continue to be pushing the, the needle on releasing people uh, from these facilities, uh, the Vera Institute of Justice has provided uh, some guidance for criminal and immigration legal systems and, the, and their actors. Now, I would encourage you all to go to our website, it's vera.org you'll be able to see that our kind of COVID-19 page. We have some spotlights on six different cities um, in the country, uh, looking specifically on how coronavirus has impacted those cities and the criminal legal system. And look at the resources that we provided. You know, it's, it's varieties from immigrant, uh, immigration system actors, parole, probation, prosecutors, defenders, police and law enforcement. There are things that we can be doing today that will help flatten the curve, help reduce the number of positive results, help reduce the number of deaths because of coronavirus uh, by the ways in which we are responding to the people that are in jails, prisons, and detention centers right now. Um, these resources are on our website. We ask that you share them, that you read them, and that you figure out what it is, um, what it is or how different ways in which we can be moving the different criminal legal system actors to do the right thing. So there's one more slide and I don't know where it is. <laughs> it was supposed to be after this one. Uh, let's see. If that's my only technical glitch, I'll take it. Uh, oh yeah, here we go. All right, I want to share my screen. There goes Sarah. <laughs> I came back. Um, I can also, I think I have it up if you would like me to share the screen. I think it's the, I can do that one second. All right, it should be up there now. Can you see it? So for everybody that's on the line, um, we're, you know, we're asking you all to join us. We want you to continue your learning by subscribing to our newsletter. 
Um, we want you to share the resources that we provided as it relates to what system actors can be doing um, to mitigate the harm that coronavirus poses to people in our jails, in our prisons, and in our detention facilities. And we want you to believe in a better criminal legal system. Um, there are things that we can be doing every single day to improve our criminal legal system. And what we are doing in uh, New Orleans and in Vera, you know, across the Institute, is that we are investing things right, investing in change right now that's going to compound over time. And as we have seen the reduction in our jail population, as we have seen the reduction in certain types of arrests, what we are really exposing are the assumptions that we have blindly followed of our criminal legal system that we simply don't need to have. People charged with nonviolent offenses probably do not need to be in jail. People that are uh, stopped by police for um, property crimes or other nonviolent offenses probably don't need to be arrested. And that we should be using this moment not only as an opportunity to be reminded of the people that are in our criminal legal system and the policies that have fueled them getting there in the first place, but also when we're on the other side of the thing of, of the coronavirus and this pandemic, what are some new policies and practices that we should be putting in place that is really rooted in equity, that's rooted in public safety, and that is rooted in best practices that we have come to know um, over the years. Um, I want to close by saying thank you for listening and tuning in to this conversation. Um, it was fun for me. I've been kind of doing a 30 minute filibuster talking to myself, which uh, isn't too bad. <laughs> And I hope we have some um, questions that we can uh, continue the dialogue with. Yeah, and we actually have quite a few questions. So um, I will uh, second the thank, thank you for joining us um, and keep them coming. So uh, one of the first questions um, that I see here is around, um, you know, the Louisiana Supreme Court sending a letter to judges to take certain actions to help reduce people's contact with the system. The question is about whether judges are actually doing those things um, and uh, what the work has looked like there. Um, so my experience has been uh, kind of earlier on the judges at criminal district court um, were waiting to see who actually the public defenders were calling to be released. Uh, I believe the public defender's office filed uh, type of like writ of habeas petition calling for the, not, the release of nonviolent folks in the jail. And I believe that motion was denied because there was not a specific names provided uh, for the judges. So uh, the Vera Institute was able to partner with the public defender's office by pulling down the jail roster and by working with the public defender's office to identify what sections of court these people um, have their cases pending. And the public defenders were able to use those lists uh, with the judges and specifically say, okay, these are the people in your court that we think you should be considering for a bail reduction or for a release. And I think there has been some success. I know if I spoke to some of my public defender friends, they would say that not enough has happened, that there are still people in the jail right now that could be safely released. Um, but unfortunately, um, the judges have not granted those motions. Um, but I do know that the judges right now, um, criminal district court is closed, like the physical building is closed but they're doing first appearances, which uh, I think are happening via Zoom. Um, first appearances, for those that aren't in New Orleans are familiar with that term. Uh, when somebody is arrested, they have their first appearance in front of a judge, has to be within 48 hours. Essentially three things happen at that first appearance. One, they determine if there's probable cause for your arrest. Second, they determine if you're eligible for a public defender. And then if there's probable cause for your arrest, they'll set a bail amount. Um, so those are still happening via Zoom but they are not holding kind of regular court, not holding um, preliminary examinations or things like that. I know across the river in Jefferson Parish, uh, that courthouse is holding preliminary examinations. They are taking plea deals to help get people out of jail and they're also addressing bail hearings as well. Great, um, there's also another question around um, whether anyone is tracking arrests that NOPD is making and should we be calling on NOPD to justify their arrest publicly in cases where they have the discretion to cite and release? Um, so I know, uh, so we are tracking the arrests and we're doing that in partnership with, or with support from the Orleans Public Defender's Office. Um, as 
people are coming through first appearances. There's a, a docket that is created. And essentially what we're doing is we're looking at the types of charges that are coming on that docket to analyze the types of cases that people are being arrested on. I know uh, that Court Watch NOLA is also tracking some of that information. I think they've been tweeting about um, the results they found from their analysis. And in terms of should we be doing a more public outcry, I think at, at bringing more public attention to the data. Um, from what I've heard from Chief Ferguson, he is really interested in maintaining discretion for his officers and deciding whether or not to detain someone. The law, I believe it's Article 211, limits their ability to issue summonses. I think for the most part, they can issue summonses on most misdemeanors, as well as I, th I think theft related um, felony cases. But outside of that, they don't have the ability to issue summonses. But that doesn't mean we couldn't create a, a practice that could require, that could um, basically not require the officers to detain somebody. So for example, if a police encounters someone that has a prescription, that has a pill without a prescription, there's nothing in the code that I'm aware of that says that person has to be arrested right then and there. They could take on that person's information, they could seize the evidence and log it in the evidence locker. They could then go apply for a warrant by a magistrate judge and that warrant would be pending and that person would not be detained. And when we're on the other side of that pandemic, that warrant could be served, that person could be arrested, that process could then uh, be initiated. Uh, but right now, despite there being limited authority for police officers to issue summonses, I think we do need to be having conversations about reducing some of these unnecessary arrests and just eliminating these ridiculous checkpoints because they serve no purpose for public safety. Great. Um, and then we have some questions uh, related to how the DA is, uh, the New Orleans DA is reacting to the coronavirus. Um, and I want to like put that together with a question around um, uh, district attorneys who are taking a position that uh, the governor's executive order means that there are no changing, um, there are no uh, uh, 701 charging deadline. So questions about district attorney. Yeah. Um, so I haven't had a conversation with the district attorney about his practices. Um, I can only go on statements that have been relayed uh, via news reports. And earlier on when advocates and public defenders and defense attorneys were calling for the release of folks from the jail, um, I believe Mr. Can or DA Canizero said um, that you know majority of the people in the jail are, are charged with violent crime and they don't need to be released and that if they are released they need to be able to prove that um, they don't have coronavirus or that they, that they have a place where they can safely go home and, and shelter in place and do social distancing and creating all these requirements and actually framed it in a way of opposing releasing people from jail as it because they were the sick ones it was my interpretation and what's important to know is that the people in jail, um, you know, the people that have been there, but for the folks that have been coming in most recently, they didn't, they didn't automatically, spontaneously get coronavirus. It was a product of the folks that have to go to work to provide for their families bringing coronavirus into the jail. And so I, I do know that's been one example of Mr. Canizero's position. And then another second example was uh, somebody that had been released uh, by a judge for um, released from the jail who had a pending case, uh, that person unfortunately was, was killed. And I thought it particularly unsettling that the district attorney used that case as an example as to why people should not be released from the jail. Now, there was some offensive language in his characterization of this person, uh, but more specifically, the whole characterization was wrong. If somebody was released from the jail and then committed a crime, that would be something for us to be concerned about. But in this particular instance, the person was released from jail. They were shot and killed a few blocks from their home, I believe. And that's, 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 your, that's, your, that's your case? That's your example of why we shouldn't be releasing people? Um, so from what I have seen, there hasn't been a lot of vocal support or uh, even behind the scenes support from what I've heard 
in terms of getting people out of the jail to protect them, particularly because they are opposing these motions, um, majority of these motions to reduce bail for people that were in the jail. I know that was a practice earlier on. And then as it relates to the 701 requirement, for uh, those that may not be familiar, 701 relates to the speedy trial, um, basically how long somebody can be detained pre-trial uh, before having their case heard. And I forgot what the, what the 701 question was. <laughs> Um, I think it was noting that um, DAs are taking the governor's executive order to mean that they don't. That, that is suspended. One. Right. Yeah. Right. Um, so this is going to be an issue, you know, uh, at least in New Orleans, your court is closed. Um, Jefferson Parish, it, you know, they're having more proceedings, but there's going to be a backlog of cases. And this is something very similar to what we have seen uh, during Hurricane Katrina when the court was closed. And unfortunately, New Orleans being where it's located, uh, we will inevitably have another hurricane, we will inevitably have another disaster, we will inevitably have uh, periods of time where the courthouse, will, the court, the legal system will not be operating. Uh, I'm very confident that advocates will be uh, litigating the application of 701 for their cases and how long somebody can be um, constitutionally detained, uh, because it certainly is an issue that has presented itself before. Um, and it will certainly present itself again. Um, and then I just wanted to note too that people have um, been asking, you know, some questions about uh, what the indication is as to why the governor has been slow to intervene, um, to, uh, to intervene with uh, people who have had commutations um, and many people have signed petitions and in fact uh, filed a, a temporary restraining order lawsuit um, to stop the plans with Camp J. And so there are a number of people have noted that that, that is a real issue. Um, and I think um, it's a, yes, yeah, it, it, it wasn't quite a question, but it was a note that came up a, a couple of times. And so I just wanted to note that too, um, that folks are, don't understand the resistance or um, the slow movement on that. Um, if you have anything you want to add. Yeah. Yeah, you know, I, I, um, I have those same questions. It hasn't necessarily been made clear from a, a strategy point or a policy point on, on why uh, there's been such slow movement. Um, I think oftentimes when we think about these, you know, the way that we see people in jails, prisons, and detention centers, we don't see them as people to be concerned about right now. I think there's probably some calculus going on as to maintaining the health and safety of those of us in the free world as opposed to those. And then, and then it's a secondary or maybe even a, a tertiary or third thought of the people that are confined behind bars on what to do with them. Uh, because we have this, you know, this, this false hierarchy of worthiness that can be established during times like these. And I would simply you know, guess that that might be playing a role. Um, but I don't know what, what it is that's causing the delay. Um, and then there were a few questions about, um, uh, you know, the, the work that we are doing with other organizations in New Orleans um, to, uh, to do prison population reduction and um, other criminal legal system reform work and notes about, um, and a question about what is happening in juvenile justice facilities as well and what we're doing to reduce those populations. Yeah, um, oftentimes Vera can play um, a, a couple of roles. Sometimes we are able to partner with organizations and provide that data support, that data analysis. We can also provide, um, you know, that policy expertise or the technical assistance. Um, as I mentioned before, from my experience, criminal justice reform in the city is a very collaborative process. And a, a beautiful example of that um, was when this state changed its unanimous juries uh, from non-unanimous juries and passed the unanimous jury bill. So many different organizations came together um, to bring that along. You know, Vera has been partners and has worked on things um, with folks from the Southern Poverty Law Center, from ACLU, from New Orleans Parish Prison Reform Coalition. Um, we're big fans and supporters of the work that's happening at VOTE, PJI, Justice Accountability Center, um, Court Watch NOLA. Um, there are so many organizations that are constantly part of this conversation. Um, that we're always excited to be in this place and, and, and occupy the role that we can through not only our data analysis or our policy expertise, 
um, but also the technical assistance in, in which way we can have conversations with certain government actors to be able to push the initiative and agendas um, of what we believe are best practices for our system. And um, we had some uh, good questions um, around, um, well, let's see. Oh, uh, congratulations on your multi-year work to end non-unanimous juries. Um, uh, yes. The Supreme Court agreed. That shout out to Council Member Gidry for that. Thomas that was versus great. Louisiana. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Thomas PJI on that too. Yeah. Um, and then uh, questions about resources that are available for supporting people who are released and returned to their neighborhoods where there may still be issues with community members. Um, and uh, this person talked about uh, some issues that happened in the last two weeks. Um, in the sixth ward where people were, um, like the perception when folks returned was that they were released because they cooperated with police or something. Um, but uh, what resources are, are there for people who are returning? Um, when I think about folks that are returning home, um, I think about the different organizations in Louisiana that are supporting those populations. So Operation Restoration comes to mind. Uh, Vote comes to mind, First 72 Plus. These are all other organizations that I uh, didn't mention earlier. But they, you know, they serve these populations. That's one of their, one of their uh, main focuses is to support people when they're coming home from prison and jail. And I'm, uh, I would direct you to their websites to see uh, what types of services and resources they have organized to provide. Um, but I think, you know, they're, in terms of the, the stigma that might be falsely applied to folks that are coming home early to think that they cooperating to come home. I think if we more uh, openly broadcast this idea that people are coming home from prison, jails, and detention centers uh, be, because of, of the pandemic that we are dealing with, that might be able to um, stifle some of those uh, false assumptions. Um, but certainly there are those three organizations are ones that come to mind that are serving that population. Yeah, and a final question um, that came in was, uh, what does um, what do we or what does Vera need from uh, the audience? How can people get involved and help um, at this time with the crisis? With yeah, I think, crisis? I think we need to, um, I think our city leaders need to hear from different concerned citizens, right? The, the folks that Kind of work and operate in the criminal justice arena and as criminal justice advocates they're used to hearing from us uh, to change certain behavior or to approve certain behavior or to criticize certain behavior and to have an opinion about how our criminal legal system is being operated and i think one of the most valuable things that you all can do is show your concern as a barber show your concern as a teacher show your concern as a parent to understand that the criminal legal system, although you may not have been directly impacted by it, but it's impacting the community in which you live in, that you have concern about how it is operating and then how people are being treated with uh, the tax dollars that we pay, because you do have a say and you do have a concern. Um, and I think showing up whenever they <laughs> open back up, whenever we can meet together, but like showing up at the criminal justice um, committee for our city council, for conversations that the mayor's office holds. Uh, being in these public spaces to share your opinions, to share your concerns is certainly one way. Um, we would ask that you use Vera as a resource, right? We often have data and information about our criminal legal system, particularly related to the jail population. Go to our website, use our information as, as, as conversation starters with people in your community. But also if you have connections to people that are working in the criminal legal system, challenge their thinking, challenge your own thinking, be on this journey of learning how we can constantly be improving our criminal legal system because we know, you know what, what the criminal legal system was built upon, um, did not have everybody in mind, particularly poor black and brown folks. And that's why we need to constantly be redefining, rebuilding and, and reshaping what our criminal legal system actually should be. And then also, I mean, I'm, you know, shameless plug, we always need financial support, right? There's nothing wrong with that. Uh, you can go to our website, um, vera.org. You can make a donation to support our work if you appreciate the things that we're doing. Um, grateful for that. We have 
Uh, Give NOLA Day is coming up. So for those in New Orleans, Give NOLA Day, I mean, anybody from around the country can, can support. But Give NOLA Day is a day in, in the city where there's a lot of support and attention brought to uh, nonprofits doing work in, in the city. And there's often, um, you know, fundraiser drives that are happening. Uh, Vera is also hosting a gala that we would be very happy for you all to buy virtual tickets to. Um, not only will those tickets support uh, the Vera Institute, but we've identified three organizations around the country that will be receiving um, some money as well. And I know Jordan's on the line, he might uh, be mad if I don't get it exactly right, but I think for every thousand um, dollars Vera raises, 500 goes to the organization. Um, there's three organizations from around the country. I know we are supporting Operation Restoration here in New Orleans, who's been doing uh, amazing work. They are such key actors and influencers of reducing the jail population. Um, they are managing the community bail fund. So when our advocates and friends, uh, defense attorneys and friends at, uh, at OPD, the Orleans Public Defender's Office, are getting those bail amounts lower, Operation Restoration is able to come in, uh, post, the, post that money to get those people out. And we have been really impressed with the work that they have been doing it. And that's why our gala um, is going to be supporting some of their work as well. And sign up for our newsletter. Yeah. Maybe half of you uh, came here from the newsletter, uh, but we want to keep this connection going, right? We want to make sure that we are a resource for you all. We would love to have all of you part of our newsletter. We're trying to grow our list. We're trying to grow our, our impact and our influence. And I think a newsletter is a really nice way for us to begin that journey. Yeah, and um, and that, that actually wraps up for our um, questions, but I did want to say, uh, Jordan said we got it exactly right, so. There you go. <laughs> Thank All right, you. well, uh, that's about it, so. Yeah, this, is, this has been fun for me. I haven't been out uh, in a while, so like this kind of putting on clothes, you know, trying to, trying to look presentable. Uh, has been enjoyable and I've been I've appreciated this virtual conversation. Um, if folks have liked it, maybe it's something that we can continue to do to continue this conversation and continue this learning. So thank you so much and I hope everybody enjoys their weekend. Stay safe and be well. Bye everyone.